Thank you for joining us today uh, at today's Revcom. This is Bertolt's Vinda Spotlight. We're going to be talking about nuclear level detection on coke drums, especially in lieu of the announcement that Thermo Fisher and MeasureTech made this year, where they're no longer going to be supplying neutron backscatter devices, which are the main uh, level detection system for delayed coke drums. Uh, my name is David Williams. I've been with Bertolt for about three years. Prior to that, I was with Omar, Omar Vega, Vega for about 18 years. I started my career after a 10 year stint in the United States Navy where I operated nuclear power plants. Uh, after leaving the United States Navy, I obtained my degree in nuclear engineering. I uh, started, like I said, with Omar Vega, and now I am with Bertolt for about three years. So today we're going to discuss uh, who Bertolt is, the different types of measurement technology, neutron backscatter, gamma continuous, uh, what to do now that neutron backscatter is gone, possible replacement strategies. Uh, one of them is replacing neutron backscatter with the gamma switches. Another one is replacing the neutron backscatter with the gamma continuous, and then also combination of the two. So we, that's what we're going to be discussing today. So who is Bertolt Technologies? Bertolt Technology is a company that got its start back in 1949 in Southwest Germany in the Black Forest. Uh, we're the worldwide leader in nuclear level gauging systems around the world. Uh, we're a family-run company, relatively small to compare to some of the other companies. But our main focus is on nuclear detection and nuclear gauging. Uh, we have over 20,000 gauges in operation around the world. We have nine subsidiaries around the world. They're located in Germany, Austria, Belgium, China, France, India, Italy, Norway, United Kingdom, and United States. We have over 350 employees around the world here to support you and uh, operating companies. And we also have representatives around the world representing South America, the Middle East, Africa, Australia, Russia, and other places as well. Bertolt's main industries where we sell into include refineries, chemical plants, petrochemical plants, the steel industry, mining, uh, offshore oil and gas, coal gasification, pulp and paper, to just to name a few. But one of our main ones is uh, refineries and some of the more challenging ones in the refineries. In 1949, Professor Dr. Rudolf Berthold founded his company in Southwest Germany. Uh, 1950, BASF was having an issue with a vessel at the Lutzenhaven plant, so they asked Dr. Rudolf Bertolt if he, they could uh, assist him. So he developed the first uh, gamma transmission level switch to help them uh, control the level in the vessel. Some other interesting facts along the history of Bertolt is in 1959, we started using large shape sources. This gives us a unique solution for certain applications that provides a very high level accurate measurement. And this is something that is normally only done with Bertolt Technologies. Uh, 2003, we developed the SuperSense, which is the most sensitive detector on the market. It utilizes a six inch crystal. This allows customers to use very low activity sources or keep using sources that has decayed over time. Uh, and still provide uh, an accurate level of measurement with it. And then in 2014, we certified our detectors for CL2, CL3 applications and stuff. This slide just shows a history timeline of all the nuclear gauge companies that has uh, sold devices into uh, the industry. Uh, some of the names you might recognize, but it started in 1949 with Berto Technologies closely followed by Omar in 1951. Some of these other names are recognizable like Industrial Nucleonics, Texas Nuclear, 
some of the names have changed on, along the way, like industrial nucleonics, changed the name to Accurate in 1975. Uh, Texas Nuclear and Nuclear Chicago merged, and then they spun off a company called K-Ray, which is uh, synonymous in the uh, cooked room industry for the neutron backscatters. But then over time, K-Ray got bought by Thermo Fisher, which was a company that bought Texas Nuclear. Uh, Accuray was another company out there. Uh, Ronan's out there, Tracy Co's out there. But over time, it's basically consolidated it back into only three or four companies. So the three main companies that's out there now are Berto Technologies, Vega, Anderson Hauser, and uh, Ronan. The reason why I bring this up is that, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we have uh, started this year that Thermo Fisher made an a announcement that they are no longer uh, providing nuclear gauges in the industry. So that means a lot of people in the cooking world is wondering what's going to happen to the neutron backscatters, what can we use for instead of the neutron backscatters, how can we replace them, what's on next path forward. So that's what we're going to be talking today. What is the what are some paths forward for customers to you if they are currently using neutron backscatters? So Berto, what is our experience? What experience do we have? We have a lot of experience in some of the challenging applications in refineries. Some of these applications include desalters, crew towers, vacuum tile bottoms, fractionation tile bottoms, delayed cokers, uh, softened asphalt units, SDA units. Um, alkalization units, resid hydrocrackers, both ebulated bed and slurry hydrocrackers, uh, FCC units, and then also on CCRs. But today we're going to talk about the solutions that we have in the late cocos and what we can do with the neutron backscatters that are currently out there. So our experience around the world, we have delayed cokers in Asia, Southeast Asia, India, Russia, Europe, Middle East, South America, and North America. Some of the big name companies that we have provided love instrumentation to, ExxonMobil, OMB, Petrom, any mall group, uh, Indian Oil, Cinepec. These are some, uh, just a few of the name of the companies that we have provided and some of, we have our experience in delayed coking. Nuclear gauges, how do they work? A lot of people assume that since the neutron backscatters and the gamma continuous gauges are nuclear gauges, they work the same. So I always take a few minutes to explain how are they differently and why are they differently. So neutron backscatter gauge, the basic principles. Neutron backscatter gauges are not level gauges, but technically a hydrogen density gauge. More hydrogen that they see, the higher the signal level that they get. Hydrocarbon vapor has more hydrogen than atmospheric conditions. So when you fill the drum with hydrocarbon vapors, you will see a slight increase in output signal on the neutron backscatters. Normally, this is when you would do your cal low on it. So when you go from a drum on atmospheric conditions to a drum full of hydrocarbon vapor, it stays at the zero point. Uh, foam has more hydrogen than the hydrocarbon vapor says. So foam comes in front of the ne neutron backscatters, the output signal will increase. Coke has more hydrogen than the foam, so as you see the coke, it would actually has a higher output as well too. Then of course, water has more hydrogen than all of that, and so you expect the highest output reading when you have water inside the drum. So let's take a close look inside the drum and the neutron backscatter detector to see how it detects hydrogen inside the drum. Inside the housing, you have two components. You have the detector and you also have the radio, radio isotope source. In this case, is an amnesium beryllium source that generates the neutron radiation. Also in the same housing, as I mentioned, you have the neutron detector. So as the neutron source generates neutrons, they are injected into the vessel and has interactions with the hydrogen and carbon atoms inside. 
So two things need to happen in order to detect neutrons. You need to thermalize them. Thermalize is a big fancy word to basically slow them down and then scatter them back towards the detector. Hydrogen is very good at thermalizing the neutron radiation. This is due to the fact they're basically the same size as neutron. The, the components of a hydrogen atom is one proton, and of course a neutron is one neutron. They're almost physically the exact same size. So when the neutron interacts with the hydrogen atom, the proton, it basically gives off a lot of energy as they collide. If that same neutron was to collide with a carbon atom, which is made up of six protons and six neutrons, it's 12 times the size. So it basically will bounce off the carbon atom without slowing down whatsoever. So this is the reason why neutron backscatter gauges are very good at detecting hydrogen, because hydrogen is very, very good at thermalizing neutrons. So when more neutrons are detected, that means more hydrogen is available inside the drum. More neutrons got thermalized. So therefore, you have a higher output. This is a directly proportional. More hydrogen means more neutrons get thermalized and scattered back towards the detector. More neutrons get detected. So therefore, higher radiation at the detector equals a higher output to the, to the DCS, which equals a higher concentration of hydrogen inside the vessel. The gamma contingency system consists of sources that are mounted on the outside of the drum, and these sources are contained with inside shields or source holders. And the purpose of these shields and source holders is to minimize the radiation around the devices, but also to shape the radiation beam going towards the detector. Typically, they're shaped in a fan beam to cover a large area on the opposite side of the drum where the detectors are located, and these detectors are measuring that gamma radiation. More radiation to detectors equals a low level because there's nothing inside the drum there to, in, to, to absorb or attenuate that radiation. So more radiation to detectors, low level, less radiation to detectors equals a high level. Anything in between the source and detector can affect the radiation. So as foam comes in between, as the vapor density changes, increases or decreases, uh, this affects the amount of radiation that gets transmitted from the sources and gets measured by the detectors. So anything in between the sources and the detector can attenuate that radiation and those detectors measures that loss of radiation and calculates it for a lower output. This is one of the reasons why the gamma continuous is really good at tracking the overall level measurement, like the top of the foam, because even though the foam has a lower density, but the drum diameters tend to be anywhere between 20 to 30 feet in diameter, the overall loss of radiation across that process path is very large, and the detectors measures that loss of radiation and tracks that level. So our complete level system will contain top point detector. This top point detector is used to measure that change in vapor density as the different cycles of the coconut. That vapor changes a little bit and therefore has a change in the radiation getting to detectors. So that top detector is used to measure that change and used to correct and compensate the level measurement for that. Then we have level gauges measured on the side of the drum. We use tower sensors. Each one of these devices can be up to eight meters long. So by cascading them together, we can cover very, very long measurement spans. Uh, we can cover anywhere from uh, eight meters all the way up to 30 meters if you cascade them together. And then we have a bottom point detector that is used to correct for coke buildup automatically inside the level system. It measures see when the level gets to a certain point and tells the system to when to calibrate, when not to calibrate. And then we have an evaluation unit that uses all these signals together to calculate an overall level output so that, that can be used to help control this, the anti-foam uh, timing of the switching out of the drum, everything that operations need to know to in order to uh, safely and reliably operate the poke drums. 
Then we also can provide a 4020 output that calculates the outage level. So when the drum is finished being quenched, a lot of customers tend to use the drill stem to try to measure where is the coke bat inside the drum. There's a lot of issues that comes along with this. Sometimes there's problems with ports being plugged on the drill head. Uh, sometimes the drill head would basically penetrate the coke bed and go down two to three feet inside the drum. Sometimes the, the coke bed is at this lowest point in the center of the drum where the this drill stem is located. Whereas since we are measuring uh, radiation from one side of the drum to the other side, the continuous level system will give a good cross-sectional average what's inside the drum. So uh, it provides a safe means of and reliable means of providing a level measurement for the outage when the coke drum is finished quenching. So now you know the basics of how neutron backscatter device works and how the gamma continuous level switch. So how do you go about replacing the neutron backscatter switches since they're no longer available on the market with a gamma switch or gamma level detector? So let's talk about where are the neutron backscatters typically located to begin with. Typically, there's either three or four neutron backscatters located on the drum. And this is just typical. It does not mean that this is what all of the coke drums around the world uh, looks like. So typically, there's one about 10 feet down from the top tangent. Uh, this is typically the one where people use it as the very last resort thing. If they get to this point, they are switching out of the drum. And then you have the one located 15 feet down from the top tangent. This is the one where most people prepare to switch at. This is what the target is, which is where they normally want to shoot for on the level. And then they have another one about 25 feet down from the top tangent. And in some locations, they have a fourth one located about six to 10 feet up from the bottom tangent. So this is the one that is not normally seen a lot of them. I would say probably about 30%, 30 to 40% of the drums will probably have this one located at the bottom. So just to show you what the outputs will look like on a DCS trend, here the green line is the neutron backscatter located at six to 10 feet above the bottom tangent line. This light blue line is the the neutron backscatter located about 25 feet down from the top tangent. The purple line is the one that's located 15 feet down from the top tangent. And then you have the yellow one, which is located at uh, 10 feet down from the top tangent. So if you see in this trend, you see that most of them, you see that this one comes in and then there's a long time frame that you see before you see the next neutron backscatter. And then after this 25 foot one comes in, you have a long time frame before the next one comes in. And then this one does not come in. This is at the point where the coke drum is uh, switched out of. You see the level drops off and then it fills up when you do your water quench. It's detecting water over here. So it does not see, typically does not see uh, level measurement during the coking cycle. This 15 foot one is typically the target switch that most people use to switch out of the drum with. So how would you go about replacing the neutron backscatter with gamma switches? This is the most economical and easiest and quickest uh, way to replace the neutron backscatters. You can add gamma switches at the same elevations to simulate the neutron backscatter devices. You add sources to one side of the drum, and you add detectors to the other side of the drum at the elevations of the neutron backscatters. These gamma switches will then replace the neutron backscatters. The outputs from these devices will simulate the outputs from the neutron backscatter gauges. And then, then you can replace the neutron backscatters and remove them and get rid of the neutron backscatters and devices altogether.
but let's take a look at the outputs to understand how can the neutron backscatter be replaced by the gamma switches. So in this one, this is a neutron backscatter gauge located about 23 feet down from the top tangent at the specific location. If you notice, when it goes from the minimum value to the maximum value, when it goes from this baseline reading to where it reads 100%, goes from that minimum to the maximum signal, it takes about 35 minutes to see that overall change. So here's the two compared side by side. So here is the neutron backscatter device We're going from the minimum signal to the maximum signal. You see it's almost a straight line up. And then here is the gamma point level switch where it goes from minimum signal to a maximum signal, which is almost a straight line up too, at the same elevation. So they're indicating the lower at the same elevation at the same time. So they're very, very comparable in outputs. So here is a DCS trend that shows a gamma point level switch located at 56% on the overall level span. So you see when the level continuous level comes up, right when it gets to be about 56%, that's when the gamma level switch comes in. When they hit it with anti-foam, the level drops off. The level drops below where the gamma point is located at, so therefore it clears itself. And then when the level comes back up again at 56%, it comes back in again. And then when they switch out, the level drops below that point, so then it clears itself again. And then, then during the water fill, the gamma point level switch comes back in again. might have noticed on this replacement with the gamma switches, I am indicating fan beam instead of point sources for this system. The reason I'm using the fan beam sources so it would be easy to add the gamma continuous level systems at a later time. At a later time. So since you already have the fan beam and you have radiation all the way up and down the side of the drum, all you would have to do at that time is add the continuous level gauges to the devices. And then therefore you would have the gamma continuous level system as well as the gamma points. So another option you can have is replacing the neutron backscatter with the complete gamma level system all at one time. So that would include adding the fan beam sources to one side of the drum, adding the continuous level gauges and the top point detector and a bottom point detector. And then at this time, I would only recommend adding point level switches at the top and middle elevations when the neutron backscatter is located. And then you can remove the neutron backscatters. So here you would have a continuous level system coming from about the top tangent down. And as I said, I normally recommend about one and a half to two times the drum diameter. So if your drum is 20 feet in diameter, that's typically 30 to 40 feet measurement span. If it's 30 feet in diameter, that's typically 45 to 60 feet in measurement span. This allows you the optimal amount of time in response to see what the foam is doing in order to control anti-foam and to optimize the amount of anti-foam that you're using at that time. So you would basically have a top point detector using it to measure the density inside the drum to compensate for any changes on the level system, a bottom point detector to let you know when the foam comes into the level measurement span, you have your continuous level gauges, and then you would have two point detectors to let you know at the same elevation of where the 10 and 15 foot was located at one time. The advantages of the gamma level system People use the gamma continuous level system to help increase coking capacity, increase the reliability of the coking unit, and also to help use less chemicals. So we're gonna talk about these one-on-one. -on -one. How do you increase throughput through the unit? You actually feed more into the drum, you go higher in the drum. So with the gamma continuous level system, it does not point. Whereas before, these were the neutron backscatter gauges, I know that I'm at this point, but not at this point yet. Where at in between? I don't know. How fast am I going to get from this point to this point? I don't know. 
when you have the gamma continuous level system, you can determine rate of change. You can see what my rate of change is as it goes up, and you can help predict your endpoint. So you can see how much room you have left in the drum. You also get better drum utilization. What I mean by that is that once you figure out safely a level that you can obtain while you're coking, you can gradually increase that till you fill the drum up more, use more in the drum. If you have the ability to feed more through your heaters and stuff, you can actually use more of the drum, better drum utilization, so you can increase the throughput through the unit. Anti-foam control. Here is the DCS trainer where you can see at these locations, you see anti-foam injections. You see the level actually drops off at each one of these anti-foam injection points. So now you can use the gamma level gauges to track how much anti-foam usage and see how useful it is. And this trend, you see the white line is anti-foam being injected in and at what rate it's been injected in for and for how long. So the area under the curve is the total volume of antiphone being injected. So you can sit there and optimize the amount of antiphone that you used. It's not only the flow, but at how much do we do and for how long. So here's another trend at the same location where they still stepped it, go to about 35%. 50%, 60%, 70%, 80% flow as it increased. So this is only 200 versus 300 as you see before. So now you're using a lot less anti-foam to control the same foam. You can increase unit reliability because now you have an effective way to measure the foam level inside the drum. Since you have that, you can help prevent foam overs from happening. Foam overs are very costly and also uh, not only to clean out the maintenance it takes to clean out, but also the unit could be down for two to six weeks while you're doing a cleaning out. And it could cost as high as $2 million, depends on the severity of the foam over at the time. Uh, we do this anti-foam usage. Like I said, you can help optimize the amount of anti-foam that you use. You can control an, an algorithm from the DCS to tell the anti-foam when to turn off and on and also adjust the flow rate automatically. This allows for easier inventory management uh, and ensures that all shifts are using approximately the same amount of anti-foam. Inevitably, it's always been my experience when I go to different locations, you have one shift location that is typically using two to three times the amount of anti-foam as the other shifts. And this also helps prevent poisoning of catalyst downstream. The more anti-foam that you use, more than anti-foam is actually carried over. It gets carried over to the hydro treater and it reduces the catalyst life in the hydro so any type of uh, reduction of anti-foam usage that you use will help increase the catalyst life and the hydro treated downstream. So these are some of the things that uh, people can talk about or experience when they are trying to replace their neutron backscatters. There's not, uh, you don't have to rip the Band-Aid off and do the full-blown system at one time. You can piecemeal it slowly but, but surely. You can do point level switch replacement to the neutron backscatters. You can add the camera continuous level switching with the point level switches. So you have variable options available to you to let you uh, pick and choose which would be the most uh, available for you or the easiest for you at the time. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please let me know. My email address is here and hopefully uh, you have some good questions during the Q&A. Thank you.